I have the honor and the joy of introducing you to Joanne Davison. And Joanne, I'd like you to come up. There's a lot of things that I could tell you and that you may be interested in knowing. Any retreat I'm at with you <laughs> makes, makes my day. <laughs> Thank you, I love you. Um, most of you know her husband, Richard Davidson. He spoke at camp meeting, and he is wonderful too. He is. And most of you know that I she just talked to him to an hour, for an hour before I came <laughs> over. Oh, okay, Just that before was I good. came at 6.30, Sherry told me I'm to be here at 6.30. I'm glad you got to do that. She has two children, uh, and her boy is a musician, and he lives in Portland. He's been there quite some time. Yes, and I wish so he could be here. Yes, and if you ever need music for your church, he yes. can do it. He He's writes all really his own an music, excellent, and excellent it's, a, it's a wonderful musician. So those are just little things I want to tell you, but what I really want to do is ask Joanne a couple questions. And if you're like me, you have questions in your mind that you'd like to ask her. And so my first question, Joanne, is when did Jesus become real to you? When did you know without question that you were his girl and that he loved you beyond words? I've loved Jesus all my life. I, but when he became really real to me is when he worked a miracle, an amazing miracle. I remember being, being a little kid being so impressed with Jesus' miracles in the Bible and people and, and around me would pray and they would have miracles. And then in my teen years, I, I was an anorectic. It wasn't a happy time. I, I, uh, it's a hard memory. And I got down to 70 pounds and I was lost all my hair, almost all my hair, and my period stopped. And I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know what the name of it. And I remember one night, falling on the floor and telling the Lord, I'm, I'm killing myself and I don't know what's wrong. And I know if you won't help me, I'm gonna die. And the compulsion to make myself throw up left that next day. And I remember going to a meal and thinking, is this gonna happen? And it didn't. After about three days of that miracle, I had a dream that I was back to my old habits and I woke up screaming and I realized I was in bed and it was just a dream and then I knew it was really a miracle and I, it, the, the thought of that has never left me that God did that for me. Cool. When, I was, when my husband was in seminary, I was working for a psychologist and I found an article about anorexia and that's the first I even knew what it was that I had had and I went and talked to my boss. He said, oh, this is really serious. I've worked with 10 and they never get you know, it's just so hard. It's, it's only a miracle that anyone gets over this. And that hit me again. That was a miracle God gave me. And that night I told Dick about it. And he said, well, that's really cool. <laughs> and he, I was afraid to tell him. That's the first time I'd ever told anybody. And he thought, it was really cool. And so he said, honey, that's just really wonderful. And he accepted me and didn't. And then the, the next level was getting over the guilt because I thought, how could God still love me for all I did to myself? And Dick helped me see that, and he's been a real wonderful blessing to remind me what a miracle God worked for me. Amen. Now, if you recall what she said and where she, how much she weighed and her hair was gone, and look at her. She is simply beautiful, isn't she? Yeah. And that is a miracle from God Amen. who loves so much. Okay, by the way, when she told me this, I said, do you want to tell that story? And she says, I'll tell it. If you think it will help someone, I'll tell it. And maybe that story was told tonight just for somebody here today or watching uh, on live stream. Another question, Joanne. There's some people that are grumpy Christians. <laughs> You're not. You're not. You are a joy-filled Christian. How do you find the joy in Jesus, how, how do you get that? Well, I, I guess I have, I have another addiction. She does have an addiction. She told me I'm addicted. I, I have addiction to God's word. There's just something wonderful there. There's just Amen. And you go a few hours and you just, you need a little more and there's always something more there. And I love the t testimony that was given yes. because when you come to the word of God, he He's there, and he's willing to, to, to share again and bless again. And there's just no place else I'd rather go. One of the things I love about Joanne is that she preaches from the Bible. Her sermons are always centered on the Bible, on God's word. Um, 
Thank you. There's so many more questions that I could ask, but I'm not going to. It's the time for our special music, okay. and then you will be on. And Joanne, take your time. We have come to hear God speak to us through you. So you have time tonight. It's Friday night, and you're all rested up and ready to listen, aren't you? And we don't have so, to work tonight. We, we don't have to work tonight or tomorrow. I can't grade papers. <laughs> I don't have to work. So you may have as much time as you need to bless us. Thank you. Oh, don't go. We have to have prayer. Oh, please. Will you bow with me in prayer? Oh, Father God, it always astounds us how much you love us. We look at ourselves, and if we only focus on ourselves, there is no hope. Mm -hmm. But, oh, Lord God, you look at us, and you see what we can through you become. You see us as we were, but we are no longer that way, all because of you. Thank you for loving us more than we can possibly imagine. Thank you that for you, heaven won't be complete if we aren't there. Thank you that if we're not there, there will be an empty place forever. Oh, Lord God, speak to us tonight. Thank you for using Joanne in the past. Thank you for what you're going to do tonight. We listen for your voice. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> Such a beautiful evening and so wonderful to see all your faces here. It's, I've been so excited to come and join you all and worship our God this weekend. Uh, my name is Elise LeBlanc, and I'm so excited to be working with the teens over this weekend and um, sharing my journey with them and getting to know them better. Um, so you might notice I have a guitar, and yes, I like to sing, and um, I'm going to be sharing a song with you guys that I wrote back when I was in college, and it was a really hard time in my life when I felt God was really far away, and I felt like he couldn't possibly love me after what I've done, and I was just at a really low point, and it was a time in my life when I felt this song coming to me, and it ended up being a prayer, and God answered that prayer and really was began to heal my heart and show me his grace and how much he loved me no matter what and uh, gave me a new beginning. So this song is all about new beginnings and how God never gives up on us. Um, and so it's a prayer to him and it's called 24 Hours. In the quiet of the morning, 6 a.m. I've just begun. I can see it getting brighter, the fog is on the run. I leave the bed and me, and the door unlocked behind. I set out for the world to give it one more try. I've got 24 hours, another chance to live. Send out a prayer, take another step. Don't who knows where in the mystery of you is. A love beyond time. Show me how, write me down. Lord, make your story mine. On the coffee and a paper, I am curious to know will my footprints wander on at the end of this old road? When I'm falter and I fall down, may I never lose the soul, the spirit and the sound. In the songs that make me grow, I've got 24 hours, another chance to live. Send out a prayer, take another step. Don't who knows where in the mystery of you is a love beyond time. Show me how, 
write me down Lord make your story mine but da da oh, oh, oh day in and day out there's nothing to give up about I slip and fall down you're the reason I keep going now you're the reason I keep smiling now. I've got 24 hours, another chance to live. Send out a prayer, take another step. So who knows where in the mystery of you is a love beyond time. Show me how, write me down. Lord, make your story mine. Ba -da -da -da. Oh, oh, Women like us, single, married, widowed, and divorced. Maybe you notice, like I have, that when you read history books, they feature kings and politicians and battle plans and victories and uh, city hall, and you would think there was a never a woman or a child that ever lived in world history. <laughs> read Michigan history. I'm sure if you read Oregon history, you have all the Indian chiefs and all the wonderful things that happened that the men do, but you would never think a woman ever did anything in Oregon. They're slowly uh, balancing that out, but God was way ahead of modern people. If you notice, God, the Bible's a history book, and the author is God. There's many different writers, but God's the author, right? He inspired it. And when he surveyed history from eternity to eternity, he gave us the Bible, and he wants us to notice all the people that he thinks are important in history. And there's a lot of women there. But we, we usually just study the men, and I'm not demeaning men tonight by studying the women, but we need to balance that out a little bit. So I want us to take courage tonight from the women of the Bible, single, married, widowed, and divorced. They're all there. Let's start with Eve, the first woman of the Bible. Now, she usually gets a pretty bad rap. You read the church father, she's the gateway to evil, you know. <laughs> but the Bible doesn't portray Eve that way. We need to see how the Bible portrays these women. There's, in fact, there's a whole new discipline in theology now called narrative theology, where we're going back to the stories, the narratives of the Bible, and notice the details that are there. And if we do that carefully, we're going to find a lot of things that we've been overlooking in God's great history book. Eve was the climax of creation. She wasn't a suspicious problem that comes up at the end. You study, uh, Jenny reminded us of the wonder sta wonderful stages in creation, and the last thing God created was Eve. The in fact, God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, but when he says he created Eve, the word there in the original language is architecturally constructed. <laughs> Men were just a pot out of clay, you know. <laughs> No, I don't want to put men down. 
But Eve was the climax of creation. You notice how it keeps getting, 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 getting. And at the end of creation, God says, very good, right? And the last thing God created was Eve. And it's marvelous if you look at the details of the story. I'm, I'm going to have a problem here. I'm going to put my Bible down here because of this. And we'll get it when we need it. I mean, we, uh, when we need to read text. It's interesting to notice the details of the narrative of Eve. When Moses wrote the story under inspiration, he used the exact same number of words to write the creation of Adam as he did to write the creation of Eve. It doesn't show up in English because translation rec wrecks that, but, but in the original language, the, uh, uh, Moses showing the basic equality between male and female because he used the same number of words. And notice when God, after God created them in Genesis 1, it said God told them to have dominion, not just Adam. That they, were, that they were both together to w have dominion there. And then the, it says in the text that Eve was Adam's helpmeet. And so often we think that is tra in English, the word helpmeet makes us think of a little lady in the little white apron. Yes, sir, yes, sir, and <laughs> curtsy. But the word helpmeet is usually applied to God. God is our helpmeet. And so when it's given to Eve, it's, a, it's not saying that she's inferior, but a, a, a person of strength that can be of help to him. And that word help me we're, w I, I, is a, um, we don't use that word anymore, but when we do use it, it ha gives us a bad connotation from what it really implied in the original language. Also there, it's interesting when it God says that, uh, the, the text says that God made Eve from Adam's rib. And it, it the Hebrew there is so beautiful because it, Moses didn't use an anatomical term, a term from anatomy that he could have used describing just one little rib. Actually, it's, it's the word there that talks, uh, that God, yes, took Adam's rib, but he took his side. Because when that word is used elsewhere, it's talking about the side of the ark or the side of a building. And so he took his rib, yeah, but he took a, a chunk. And, and, and Adam notices this. What does he say when he sees her? He says, a bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He knows that they're absolutely equal, made out of the same kind of stuff. It's really beautiful, and he, he breaks into poetry. It's the first poetry in the Bible is when Adam sees Eve. It's the first romance. And the, the, the best part is not even in, the, in translation. Some translations say indeed or at last, but the word my Hebrew teacher told me is when Adam woke up and saw this gorgeous architecturally designed woman, <laughs> he said, wow! <laughs> and how do you translate that? And so they'll say, indeed, or at last. But it doesn't give the excitement that's in his voice there. <laughs> also, you notice that Eve was the first in sin. But we have to notice carefully there, too, that her sin was a sin of deception. Mm -hmm. She was deceived, and it's tragic, and it's awful. But the worst sin was Adam's sin. His was a deliberate, called in the Bible, a high-handed sin. He knew exactly what he was doing. And notice that Adam's sin had to be redeemed by Jesus coming and being a second Adam. There is no second Eve because the sin of deception could be forgiven. But in the Bible, the sin of high-handed sin, according to the Levitical rules, it was punishable by death. And so God came and reversed the curse, and he became the second Adam. But Eve was forgiven. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. So we got to put Eve in her place. She was a gorgeous woman and not some problem that God had on his hands after he made a mistake in creation yeah. week. <laughs> Let's move on to the patriarchal period, Sarah. We know she was beautiful because two kings wanted her in their harem when she was in her 80s. That's pretty good looking. <laughs> and remember when they got, when, a when Abraham was traveling once to Egypt and once to Gerar, he told, he begged Sarah, please lie for me and tell them that you're my sister so they won't kill me to, to get you in their harem. I think that's kind of cool. <laughs> he, notice he had to ask her. He didn't order her. The basic equality between male and female is still existing in the patriarchal period. You'll read a lot by the feminists who say the patriarchal period was so bad it put women down. No, it doesn't. You read the narratives carefully, there was basic equality there. If, there, if, there, if it was a time of hard-fisted uh, hard uh, maleness, he would have ordered her to lie, but he begs her to lie. He asks her to lie. And then when, when he does take Hagar as a surrogate because Sarah hasn't been able to conceive. It was Sarah's idea. Yeah. It wasn't Abraham's idea. And, and so Abraham was faithful to Sarah, even in her barrenness. It's a, they had a beautiful marriage. They really did. And, and when, 
when she dies, he, he weeps, it says. He weeps. And God later reminds us how important Sarah is to the covenant, not just Abraham. Listen what God says in Isaiah 51. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Listen to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah who bore you. And so when God refers back to the time he established the covenant line, he says both Abraham and Sarah. And remember, God had to teach Abraham that Sarah was just as important to the covenant as he was. Because remember, twice Abraham said, well, can Eliezer be my heir? And God says, no. And then, God, and then another time God said, but I have Ishmael, and my son. Ishmael is my son. And yet, yes, God is, said, Ishmael is your son, but Sarah's son will be the son of the promise. And God had to teach Abraham that it was just as important, Sarah was just as important to the covenant as he was. Isn't that beautiful? But we got to look at Hagar. Very unfortunate situation that is still working out in the Middle East today. Yeah. Still working out. But, but, but look, I mean, would you have lost faith at 90 years old <laughs> that you would have offspring as numerous as the stars in the sky? Of course, today we can't see many stars anymore because of pollution. But in back in those days, they could see many, many stars in the sky. And God had promised Abraham, you're going to have heirs n as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Have you ever tried kindly the, the sand on the seashore of your or beautiful Oregon coastline? Have you tried? <laughs> and they really took that literally. And, and at 90, uh, and she was 90, and Abraham was 100, Sarah was 90. They, they thought maybe they should help God. You know how we try to think we can help God. <laughs> I still find myself doing that. I'll help you, God, help, help you solve this problem. No, God says, Joanne, let me help you solve the problem. But uh, they took, they did this thing, and Ishmael was born, and it, it upset the home because uh, God had a different design for marriage and even their marriage. And finally, uh, Sarah said, you must send this slave woman and her son away. And God told Abraham that Sarah was right. So he did that. But it, can you imagine how hard that was for Abraham? It was, it was his first son. And it was very, very difficult. And Hagar goes out to the wilderness, and she's just crushed. And you know what happens? God doesn't forsake this woman. The very first time in the Bible that the angel of the Lord appears is to this forsaken woman. And he calls her by name. That's the only reason we know her name. Abraham and Sarah refer to her as that slave woman. But the angel of the Lord comes to her and calls her by her name, Hagar. That's why we know. And we know it's also God talking because by the time they're done, she, she names God. She says, God has looked at me. See, Jesus appeared as the angel of the Lord before he came as a human being in the New Testament. That's how it was his Old Testament personal manifestation many times. But Hagar knew. And have you read carefully that beautiful narrative in the, in the desert when God gives Ishmael a promise almost like the one they'd been hearing of the covenant. God said, I will make you a great nation, and you will have sons. And God takes care of this poor woman, this rejected woman, and doesn't leave her. It's an amazing story, amazing story. And then there's Rebecca. We're told she's beautiful. She's tov, just like creation. But that's, that's the only, thing we, only time that's mentioned. The rest of the time we see her character. You know, God in his history book puts a lot more detail about Rebecca than he does Isaac. She talks. She does all, she's a very uh, 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 strong woman. And, and we know a lot. You read the story of Isaac and Rebecca. There's the longest chapter in the, in the book of Genesis is about Rebecca. When Abraham sends his servant to go back and find a wife, a God-fearing wife, so he wouldn't marry one of the Canaanite women. And so the servant goes back there, and it's a neat chapter, and he comes there, and he asks God to give him a sign, and, and, and Rebecca fulfills the sign. She doesn't even know it, but she fulfills the sign, and, and she, she waters the camels, it says, and she runs back and forth. I love those details. You know why she had to run back and forth to water camel? They don't lap when they drink. They <laughs> siphon. They go two weeks without water, but then when they drink, lapping is enough, and the, you watch the water go down. I've lived in the Middle East, and it goes... <laughs> And they just suck it up. And so it, it's just amazing. It says she's running back and forth, and, and then she, uh, uh, the, the 
she invites him to her, her mother's home and see the servant tells the story and, and they say, well, give us a little time to think it over. And he says, no, I can't wait because my, my master will be worried about me. I'm taking so long. And they, and they said, I love it. They said, well, ask Rebecca if she wants to go. So if the patriarchal period was a time when women were subjugated, as the feminists like to say, they haven't read the stories because they let Rebecca choose whether she wanted to go. Furthermore, back at the beginning of the story, when Abraham sends his servant, what does he tell him? If the woman is not willing to come, you are released from this vow. And so from the very beginning, even Abraham respects the fact that Rebecca gets to choose. It wasn't a forced family arranged marriage. The woman got to choose. It's a beautiful story. And Rebecca is a, is a, a, a wonderful picture there in the gen Genesis Matrix. We know a lot about, more about her than even her husband. Let's go on to Deborah, the first Deborah. Now, if, let me ask you a question. If you were writing a history book, let's get this in perspective. The book of Genesis has 50 chapters, as you know. And the book of Genesis covers 2,500 years in 50 chapters. Do you feel that? And the last 11 chapters are about Joseph. The narrative slows way down to Joseph and Judah. But we have 50 chapters covering 2,500 years. And then we have the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy cover 80 years. You see the difference? So the book of Genesis covers a vast period of time, and God drops in different times and tells us different narratives and stories of people that he really wants to inspire us. Now, if you were writing a history book covering 2,500 years, would you put this little story in about this lady? Let me read what the Bible says. Genesis 35. So Jacob came to Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan. He and all the people were with him. And he built an altar there and called the place El Bethel because God appeared to them, him there when he fled the face of his brother. Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried underneath a terebinth tree, so they called the place the Tree of Weeping. Two little verses about this nurse. If you were writing a history book, of 2,500 years, would you include that little story of that first Deborah? Probably a single woman. She devoted her whole life to Rebecca. She traveled back with her when Rebecca got married, but she never did. And God wanted us to know the faithfulness of this woman. Ellen White tells us that in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, that God deliberately put this, this little tiny story of this lady in here to remind us of the faithfulness and the godliness of the first Deborah in the Bible. Isn't that touching? God notices women. Let's move on to Miriam. Now we will, uh, Jochebed of course is her mother and her mother was uh, very insightful trying to save her son, little baby life in the face of the death decree and she puts Miriam by the river to watch the basket, right? And Miriam was very diplomatic. I don't know how old she was but she wasn't full grown I'm sure. She was the firstborn, then Aaron, then Moses and, but uh, uh, Jochebed sent Miriam to watch little basket. But the story of Miriam in the, in the Exodus is marvelous. She never married. She was a single woman. We know, that we know the name of Moses' wife and his sons, and we know that Aaron, Aaron had four sons, so we know he married. But there's never any mention of any husband or children for Miriam. She was probably a single woman. A great woman. When we think of Miriam, we think of her great mistake. And that's tragic because both her brothers made terrible mistakes too. But we never, we never draw those out of, the, out of the hat. But whenever we think of Miriam, we think of her big mistake. But you know, God forgave her, and she was sorry. And the picture we have of Miriam is marvelous. She's one of the few women in the Bible that are mentioned as a prophet, Exodus 15. She was a great musician, and after the Exodus, um, the Exodus uh, a miracle at the Red Sea, it says that Miriam led the singing. She was a great musician, and she uh, was, a, was a, a wonderful woman, and we need to... Picture that when we think of Miriam and not just her great mistake. She's a great lady. There's a genealogy in 1 Chronicles chapter 6 and it lists all the family names. And that's the only reason we know Moses' dad's name because it lists Amram there. And in, the, in Exodus it doesn't even mention him by name. But we know this thing and it mentions all the, the uh, genealogies leading up to, to Moses. And it, then it comes to Amram and it says, And his sons were Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Now, the whole chapter is all fathers and sons. And when it comes to this one little not line of Amram, they translate it children. But it's the same word used all the way through, this fathers and sons. And Miriam, you can begin to see how important she was. She's considered one of Amram's sons. 
She was a great lady. Let's move on to the story of Rahab. Now, there's no way that you're going to be able to forget her employment. <laughs> because every time her name is mentioned, even in the book of Hebrews, we're reminded she was a harlot. She was a prostitute. And some, I used to th wonder, well, why, do you, wh why can't you just tell me once that she's a harlot and then just let her name be appear without the title after it? But maybe God wants us to hear that drumbeat of her profession to know that there is nobody that falls beneath his loving care. God cares about even the prostitutes. And Rahab was a marvelous story that, put, put, puts, puts, that God put in the Bible for her. She's commended for her great faith in the book of Hebrews. She is an agent of salvation for her family. The spies tell her, bring your family here and we will spare them if you put this cord in your window. And she gathered her family so they could be spared. She, she was a, great, a woman of great courage when the spies came. What did she say? We've heard about your God and how strong he is. And she was willing to risk her life to save them. I know she lied. And then when I teach ethics, everybody says, well, see, it must be OK to lie. No, it's not OK to lie. Amen. It's not okay to lie. She is never commended for her lying. She was, a, she was a Canaanite woman. She was living in a vile culture. She did the best she knew. But in the book of Hebrews, when she's commended to say, by faith, we must honor Rahab because she lied. No, we're to honor her because of her faith. Amen. In the face of the Canaanite culture at that time that God said must be destroyed because they were burning their children. Rahab stood up for the true God of heaven and did the best she could. Amen. And God put her, her, her name in the Bible. Move on to Ruth, another romance. Another widow. It's, it's a, a most amazing story to me. One of the two Bible books named after a woman. And her f she marries a young Hebrew boy. Her, fa her father and mother had come to Moab because of a famine. And they fell in love with two Moab, the, her two, or Naomi and her husband's sons fell in love with two Moabite girls. And I wonder if this was a cause of concern for Naomi. But if it was, she never let on. And she witnessed and loved those girls, loved them. Then the, the most tragic thing happened. She lost her husband and lost her two sons. And all she had left were two pagan daughters-in-law. She decided to return home to her homeland because she had nothing else there. And she urged her girls to stay and remarry. You're young and you're, you can find a husband and a family. I have nothing. And Orpah at first refused, but then she did the smart thing. She did. She went, went back to her, to her family. You would think it was the smart thing to do, but what does Ruth say? She looks at her widowed, destitute mother-in-law and says, your God will be my God. God. And it's those times of extreme suffering when most people give up their faith in God. No and that she, Naomi had nothing to give Ruth, nothing. And, but Ruth had seen something in her godly mother-in-law that made her know that this was the, the, the way she wanted to live her life. She was willing to leave her homeland, her culture, her family, her Moabite gods, everything she ever knew to travel back to an unknown country with a destitute, widowed mother-in-law. That is a picture that you don't see often. She, wasn't, she didn't move back with, Ruth to, with Naomi to find a husband. She wanted to worship Ru Naomi's God. And well, the story ends with a romance, of course. But that isn't what, why Ruth went back there. She just said, I'm going to go back with you and find a husband in Israel. She said, no, I want to be worship your God. I think it's the most beautiful picture of, of a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law who in a face of, great face of great tragedy held on to the true God of heaven. And God drew this destitute Moabite widow into his own genealogy, didn't he? You know how the book of Ruth ends with a genealogy? And genealogies are dry to us. We kind of skip over them. But that's the way God tells us, you know, I'm really in charge of history. I know what I'm doing. And God... You know, when people put out their pedigree, they don't usually put out the black sheep. <laughs> but Jesus did. He put out this destitute Moabite widow. Amen. He put in Rahab the prostitute because he was proud of these women. Amen. He saw something in them, like the testimony we just heard, 
saw something in them that he wanted and knew that they would uh, uh, be his children. Precious story. Ruth's call, Ruth leaving Moab was just like Abraham leaving Ur, right? Abraham left his family, left his, uh, left his culture, left everything, but he left with a wife and riches and servants and animals. And I'm not, I'm not making light of Abraham's call of faith and what he did. But Ruth, what she did was even more dramatic, wasn't it? She left everything just so she could stay faithful to God with her mother-in-law. It's a beautiful picture. Well, let's, let's keep, keep moving here. The second Deborah, Judges, time of Judges. Now, you've got to look, let's do a little more narrative work here. You look at this book of Judges, it's quite an interesting sequence there. The children of Israel are unfaithful to God. They fall into apostasy. They cry unto the Lord. He has pity on them and sends a judge. And the judge delivers them, and they have peace, and then the judge falls into apostasy. So it starts all over again. They fall into, the judge leads them into apostasy. They, God allows them to be ca uh, captured by a foreign power to, to bring them to their senses, and they cry out, and God raises another judge. And then that judge falls into apostasy. And so it's a, it's a cycle, downward cycle. Each judge gets worse and worse. The one exception is Deborah. Amen. The one female judge. The pe people of Israel were at peace the whole time she lived. They only fell into apostasy after she died. She kept them faithful to God. God. An amazing story of Deborah. You remember all the hoopla that we have when, whenever a woman gets added to the American Supreme Court? <laughs> Really, really big. And it's good that they're finally balancing that out a little bit. Oh. <laughs> well, we won't go there. But Deborah was an Israeli, was the Supreme Court Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. That's what she was, that she was a judge. And men and women would come to her and she solved their problems. She was also a prophet. And uh, she was also a great general in the war. Remember, the king would not go to war without Deborah. She says, what's the matter? God's called us to the task. Let's go. He's going to be with us. And it, it took the Deborah to give him courage to do this. She was also a musician. J Judges 4 tells the story, and then Judges 5 tells us her song that she composed as the result of the miracles that God worked. And there she, we see that she's a wonderful poet. She, uh, I read a, a commentary by a man once. And he said, uh, he wonders if in the original language they misspelled the name and, and that it was really a man. <laughs> I wish I could have asked him in person, did you read the whole story? <laughs> it says she was a wife, too. That one little phrase you mustn't forget. So we can't mistake her. She was a wife, so she, we know she was a woman. Let's go to the Shunammite woman. Do you, do you know, remember Elisha's miracles when he comes? How many of those are for mothers and widows? Isn't that marvelous? Remember the widow's oil, and she, could, she was going to have to go into slavery, and Elisha works a miracle for that widowed mother for her two children with the oil that didn't run dry. And then there's the Shunammite woman. And usually when we study the story of the Shunammite woman, we always think of the wonderful miracle that Elisha worked. You know, there's 25 verses describing what this mother did. Only three or four verses describe the miracle. What's God wanting us to notice? He's wanting us to notice that what a mother does for a sick child is reflecting his very image. Because that was in a day when a woman could not just go to the store and buy the soap she needed or the shampoo she needed or the cloth she needed to sew something or buy a rug to put on the floor. She had to grow the cotton, grow the wool, make the thread, weave the cloth, weave the material before she could even sew. That was the day you couldn't go buy pasta. If you wanted pasta, you made it. And, and, and yet when her boy was sick, she spent all, it takes 25 verses to describe all she did to take care of him. I love that picture in the Bible. God is showing that what mothers do is part of what God, is in God's heart himself. He says, look what I do for my kids, tending them when their heart's sick and hurting. And have you noticed how some things never change? What happens, what did the dad say when the little boy got sick? Take him to his mother. <laughs> Th some things never change. <laughs> but it's, it's a beautiful picture. Of, uh, it, why, why did God spend so much time on this woman and just a few verses on the miracle? I think, that, I think we as women can understand that God wants us to see how he views the world. Let's look at the Queen of Sheba. 
one of the rare pictures in the Bible of two monarchs discussing wisdom and not making war. It's the only picture in the Bible like this. Every time you have kings together and generals, they're planning wars and war plans. But this is the one solitary picture in the Bible of two monarchs discussing wisdom. Don't you like what it says there? It says, Queen of Sheba heard about Solomon's wisdom, so she came with a very large retinue to test him with hard questions. So she was no dummy either. <laughs> and Solomon was able to answer all of her questions. And you know what? What was her testimony when she was done? Not praising Solomon, she says, how great is the God praise you serve. God. How, God. how blessed are the people to be under the kingship of your God. And Solomon was able to witness to, to, to this pagan queen about the greatness of God. And she was uh, able to ask him hard questions, you know. Sometimes I have to work at thinking up hard questions for my students. But the Queen of Sheba came with hard questions. She was a great lady. Huldah, 2 Kings 22. You remember the, the history of Israel, how slowly and slowly they fell into apostasy and, finally, apostasy, and finally they were using the temple for the garbage dump. You remember that? And then lo the little boy Josiah becomes king, and he has them clean out the temple, and they find a scroll. That shows you how far they had gone from God that they didn't even know what the scroll meant. But they, the, the scribe and the, the, uh, the men who found it brought and read it to the king, and he, and he said, oh, this is awful. This is the state we're in. This is exactly what we're doing. This means that the curse of God's going to be on us. What does this mean? And, and he, what does he do? He says, take it to Hulda and ask her to explain it to us. Well, some male commentaries say they said to take, he said to take it to Hulda because there were no male prophets around. That's true. But they haven't done their homework because Jeremiah and Huldah were contemporaries. But when the king wanted to understand what the Bible said, he said, take it to Huldah. And Huldah reads the text and explains to them what the text meant and what God uh, had, had said what happened when they would fall into deep apostasy. It's, a, it's an amazing story. And again, it can't be a man like they try to say, well, maybe it was a man, maybe they spelled the name wrong, because again, God puts in the nice little detail, she was a wife, so we can know it's a woman. <laughs> great lady, great lady. She was a theologian, and when they wanted to understand what scripture meant, they took it to Hulda. Let's go to Queen Esther, the second Bible book named after a woman. You know the story of this um, young captive girl who was apparently very beautiful, and her father heard about the beauty contest and saw how the beauty of Esther said, you should go see what happens, but don't tell anybody you're Jewish because there are captives there. So she goes and she wins the king's heart and she becomes a queen. And in the time of the most grave danger to her, she admits her ethnicity to save her people's life. At the time of the death decree, when you would think she would keep, keep it undercover, she plans a way to, to save her people's life by admitting who she is. You notice all the women in the book of Esther are very strong women. Vashti, the king's first wife, would not appear before the drunken men of this party in a way that suggests impurity. She wouldn't do it. She was willing to lose her crown to, to, to stay pure. And then there's Zeresh, who is uh, Haman's wife, who, who had to explain to him you know, what's happening here is, is bad omen for you. She could see it, but <laughs> Mordecai couldn't, couldn't see it. But Esther, she was a, she was a, a brave woman, and her, her uncle said, you've got you've to do something. And she says, but I, you've got to go before the king and plead our life. She says, but I can't. The, the custom here is that you, you have to be invited, and I haven't been invited for, for a long time. And he said, maybe this is the reason God made you queen. Maybe, that, maybe you're in the kingdom for just such a time as this. And she was willing to risk her life. You know, Ahasuerus was not a um, godly monarch. He would just kill people when he was tired of them. And, and, and yet uh, God moved on his heart, and he was able, he, Esther was able to work with him and save her people's life. The marvelous picture of the courage of this young woman. Another savior in the Bible. Let's move to do some New Testament women. Elizabeth, Zechariah's wife, Luke chapter 1, one of the few times a priest's wife is named. And in Luke 1 verse 5, there's a neat description of Elizabeth there. It says, Zechariah, what, 
order priest he was, and, and Elizabeth was his wife, and it says, and they were both righteous before the Lord. I love that word, both. God, when he was inspiring Luke, you know, Luke was the only Gentile that wrote a book of the Bible, and when God inspired this great physician to write this story, he, he inspired him to put that word, both, in there that these two were two, two godly people, husband and wife, not just the priest, in a neat story. And then there's the, the, the picture of Mary. You know, God is the only person that was able to choose his parents. <laughs> we all got what we got. <laughs> but Jesus handpicked his parents, and he picked Joseph and Mary. And Mary... It is a marvelous picture of the angel coming to Mary and telling her about this. And she realized that she would be unmarried and be a talk of the town. But she was willing to accept the, the responsibility. How we, uh, it, it, there's a neat little detail in the story. It says when after Mary, after a few months after Mary was pregnant, it says she, with haste, she went to see Elizabeth. Why is that little detail with haste? It didn't just say she goes to see Elizabeth. It says she went to see Elizabeth with haste. This is what I think is going on here. That word both. Elizabeth was righteous. And I can just imagine that when Mary was at home and she started showing, you know, now women wear really tight clothes to show because it is so beautiful. Well, back then you covered it up. And she started showing. And people say, Mary. You and Joseph aren't even married yet. And she said, well, an angel told me. <laughs> and they said, oh, that's a nice try, Mary. You think I'm going to believe that? And she, you, could be, you could just understand how difficult it was for Mary. But she knew Elizabeth would believe her. So with haste, she goes to see Elizabeth, and, and she tells Elizabeth, and what does Elizabeth say? Oh, blessed be the Lord God that I am privileged to see the mother of my Lord. She says, I'm so excited. My own baby's leaping in my womb. It's the most beautiful picture, and that's why we know that word both is there. Mary knew there was some place she could go that someone would believe her. It's a beautiful picture of these two women. Two women, are both enjoying miracle pregnancies, right? Yeah. Elizabeth was well past childbearing age. That was a miracle. Mary wasn't married. That's a miracle that she could be pregnant. And God gave these two godly pregnant women, both sharing a miracle pregnancy, to have this precious time together because both of their sons would later die violent deaths. But God gave them this one chance to affirm their faith in what God was doing in most unusual ways. Beautiful picture. Then there's Anna, Luke chapter 2. Anna? That 84-year-old widow, right? So she's 84. She'd only been married seven years. She'd been a widow the rest of her life. And she spent her time praying and fasting in the temple for the Messiah. And then when Mary and Joseph came in to dedicate baby Jesus, she knew that that was the Messiah. See, people who pray a lot recognize God's hand when it happens. Amen. And she knew, and she and the verse goes on to say, she went on to announce the birth of the Messiah in Jerusalem. Now, that verse is so cool in the original language. It's very nice in, in English, but there's much more there in the original language. In, in English, we, have a, we, we, we know how often we do something by saying, I did it once, I did it twice, I did it four or five, six times. But in the Greek language, you shape the verb. And so when it says she spoke of him, the, the shape of the bird, ver verb will tell you whether she did it once, twice, or over and over. And the shape of that verb that she spoke of him in Jerusalem is means she did it over and over and over and over again. In the capital city of Jerusalem, she announced the Messiah's birth in the capital city of Jerusalem. You would have thought God would send a handsome prophet to do this. He took an 84-year-old widow to announce the birth of the Messiah Praise in the God. capital city of Jerusalem. That's right. So when you're a widow and you're in your 80s, don't think that your life is over. Just say, God, what do you want me to do for you today? What do you want me to do for you today? Wonderful. God, Jesus was always thoughtful of widows, wasn't he? 
Remember in the Old Testament, he told people, you must take care of the widows and the orphans. And Jesus did this in his own life, didn't he? He was it over and over again. The widow with two mites. She comes to church, and all the dignified, wealthy religious leaders, well, they didn't take up offering the way we do now, with these silent dishes passed between the pews. Back then, you had a big metal, uh, br a bronze um, k uh, um, urn, and, and they would drop their money in one coin at a time, so you would hear this clinking sound. Well, not everybody, but the ones that wanted to impress you. This little widow comes to church, and she wants to give her offering. And she knows it's nothing compared to what the rich people are doing. And so she sneaks in shyly and just quickly drops them in and hurries away. And Jesus is always turning the tables. And he told his disciples, you see that woman? She gave more than everybody else here today together because she gave all that she had. Amen. The rest of them gave out of their surplus, but she gave everything that she had. Jesus is always honoring widows. He knew. See, it's the heart that makes the gift. It's not the amount. And Jesus understood that and praised this woman. Then there was the widow of, of Nain. Jesus stopped a funeral procession and shows that he has the power to resurrect from the dead. So we can rejoice that resurrection day is coming. Amen. But he stopped a funeral procession. This, this was a widow. This is all she had left. She'd already buried her husband in the cemetery. She knew the way to the cemetery all right. And now her only child had died, and they were going to bury him that day. And I'm, sh I'm sure that was the most devastating day of her life, and she, her tears were blinding her, and all of a sudden she heard someone stop the funeral procession. And Jesus doesn't ask this woman to have faith. He doesn't ask her to forgive if she wants her sins forgiven. He just raises her son. It's the most marvelous picture of the, of the Messiah and his love for families and widows. Doesn't ask her to show, do you, do you believe I can do this? Now, he does that with some people, and he needed to. But in this case, with this poor widow, he just healed her son. And, and it says he lifted him up and brought him back to his mother. Jesus ever loved widows. Let's look at one of Jesus' Sabbath miracles. You know, in the Desire of Ages, it tells us that Jesus performed more miracles on Sabbath than any other day of the week. See, Sabbath is a day for miracles. Sabbath is not a restriction. Amen. It's a day for blessing and, mi and miracles. And we've got to start thinking of it that way rather than, let's see, when can I get back to my real life? The Sabbath is the zenith of life. Amen. And Jesus is preaching in the sanctuary, uh, sa uh, temple one Sabbath morning, and this crippled woman comes in, says she's bent over double. She doesn't recognize people by their face. She can't straighten up. She recognizes people by their shoes. Oh, hi, those are pretty tennis shoes. Yeah, I remember you. Hi, happy Sabbath. <laughs> oh, you have sandals on. Yeah, I remember you. Happy Sabbath. She couldn't look anybody in the face. And Jesus says Jesus was teaching, and he saw her come in, and he stopped the sermon. This is, wouldn't it be fun to do? <laughs> and he tells her to come up front. And I'm sure she's embarrassed because she just wanted to be in God's house on Sabbath. I'm sure she was a single woman, because there's a rare man will marry a woman in this condition. And think of how difficult it was for her to get there, and how easily we excuse ourselves from worship. I ate a little too much last night. I think I'll watch 3ABN this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but this crippled woman wanted to be in God's house, no matter how hard it was. Amen. She had no idea what was going to happen. But Jesus saw her, and Jesus is God, and Jesus knows hearts. And so he called her up to the front, and he, he laid his hands on her, Jesus' loving hands. Do you suppose it had been a long time since she'd been hugged? It would be hard to hug a woman like that, you know? And Jesus laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight. And the first face she saw straight on was the face of Jesus. And she praised God, but the presiding elder was not quite so happy. And he looks at the congregation, he says, please, six days you work. Don't come on Sabbath to be healed. Come on some other day. As if this lady came to be healed. She didn't know. And Jesus, I love Jesus' answer. Notice, the first thing Jesus says, looks him right in the eye and he says, hypocrite. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. <laughs> now we can't do that. We can't do that because we don't know hearts, but Jesus is God and he knew this man was a hypocrite. And he, he gives a, an, an analogy. He says, don't, don't you lead your, your farm animals to, to drink water on Sabbath morning 
Well, of course you do. You know, the, uh, you, you remember the f fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment includes the animals, includes the strangers, and the animals are, deserve Sabbath rest. They've worked hard too. We underestimate how much God loves animals. That's another whole talk. But God says, and, and maybe some Sabbath morning your, your ox doesn't want to go get a water. He knows that you're in a hurry, and so he's going to be stubborn, right? And so you're pulling him because you know you're going to be gone and it's going to be hot and he's going to be miserable, but you've got to let, you can't let him be miserable on Sabbath. So you're getting dusty and dirty and sweaty, but you <gasps> finally get him to the water hole and you get him back there. Jesus said, you would do that, and that's right for you to do. That's exactly right. Animals deserve the Sabbath rest too. Should not this daughter of Abraham, whom Satan is bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed on the Sabbath? Sabbath is a day for miracles. That's what it's all about. It's not what something we do for God. It's something God will do for us. I love his calling her the daughter of Abraham. It's the only time that phrase is used in the Bible. Well, you know that the religious leaders were always reminding Jesus, <coughs> do you recognize us as the sons of Abraham? They were always very proud of their pedigree, you know. Well, Jesus took away this lady's 18 years of crippledness and gave her a pedigree, gave her the pedigree, the daughter of Abraham. You've looked down at her because of her crippledness, but I'm telling you, she's a daughter of Abraham. Amen. And remove the indignity of her crippledness. Well, some people like pedigrees, you know. I was on a plane once flying back from Boston and happened to be sitting by a very handsome man, young man, well-dressed suit. And he, before, I mean, I really didn't care to talk to him, but he wanted to make sure I knew his pedigree. <laughs> I wanted to read. He'd give me a chance to read, you know. So he wanted me to know that his ancestors had sailed to this country on the Mayflower. <laughs> he was very proud of that. So I, I thought I'd have a little fun. I'm not proud of what I did. I'm not so... <laughs> And I'm not sure I was the right thing to do <laughs> because it destroyed the rest of our chance to discuss something more important. But I sat up as straight as my, stall, stall, my short stature will allow me in an airplane seat, and I looked him right in the eye, and I said, my ancestors sailed on a very famous ship, too. <gasps> and he really looked at me. <laughs> now it was important because I had a pedigree. Before, I was, he was dickling down at his nose at me, you know, but now he was very interested in me. And he said, which ship? And I looked him right in the eye and I said, Noah's Ark. <laughs> and he went, oh. <laughs> And that was the last words we spoke to each other. <laughs> so I'm not sure it was the right thing to do. I think the Lord would have probably liked me have a better, a better discussion. But Jesus gave this woman, this crippled woman, the, the honored pedigree of a daughter of Abraham. Then there's the bleeding woman, the woman with the issue of blood. She wants to see Jesus, probably a single woman, because be, be, being bleeding at that time in Jewish culture would make her unclean. So she heard of Jesus and knew that would be her last chance. But she didn't dare come to him because she knew that she would defile him. But she thought, maybe if I could just touch his robe. And so she presses through the crowd and reaches through and just barely makes it, and instantly she's healed. And what does Jesus say? Who touched, me? who touched me? And his disciples can't get it. Everybody's around you, Lord, and you ask who touched me, and Jesus knows the difference between yearning fingertips and pushy elbows. And he wanted this people that were crowding around to understand this woman's faith. His robe wasn't magical. It was her faith that did it. So he kept asking, and finally the lady thought she should confess, and she thought maybe Jesus would scold her for defiling him, but Jesus held her up as a paragon of faith to everyone else because she had trusted in Jesus. Daughter, your faith has made you well, not my robe, and held her up. He's never ever able to say that about his disciples, that your faith is honorable. He never did that to them, but this great lady's faith. Let's move on to the Syrophoenician woman, the mother from Tyre and Sidon, that neat passage where it says Jesus needed to go through Tyre and Sidon, and by the end of the story, you know why. And the 
Syrophoenician mother. This is, sort of goes with the Shunammite mother in the Old Testament. It's the New Testament mother now. Follows Jesus and begs him to heal her daughter. And apparently she was very annoying, just saying, oh, please, 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 and just wouldn't let him go. And the disciples are disgusted because they're, they, they're prejudiced against pagan people. And they say, send her away. This is embarrassing. And Jesus turned to her and said, you know, it's not right for us to give, to feed, to, to uh, my, I, my mission is to the Jewish people. It's not right for me to cast the bread to the dogs. And people read that and they think Jesus is being rude. But Jesus was showing, uh, Ellen White in Desire of Ages tells us that Jesus was showing his disciples what they sounded like. He was giving them an object lesson. This is what it sounds like when you treat people this way. And then I love her answer. Even the little puppies get crumbs under the table, don't they? And Jesus looked at her and said, woman, great is your faith. Mm -hmm. Not once did he ever tell that to his disciples. Not once. And I love the description of this in Desire of Ages. Ellen White writes that Jesus went to Tyre and Sidon because he knew of this woman was seeking him. And he wanted to put himself in her path. And when he gave the answer that would have discouraged most people, and which has been wrongly interpreted in many commentaries, Ellen White adds the detail. When Jesus said that, he had a compassion in his face that he couldn't hide. And so she pressed her point home. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus put himself in her path so that he could show his disciples a woman of faith. Precious, precious Jesus. Always loved mothers and widows. Let's move on to a couple more. Martha. Martha, we usually think that Jesus is criticizing her and applauding Mary, her sister. But remember when Martha gives her testimony of faith at Lazarus' grave? I believe you are the son of God. So she was a student too, and she loved Jesus. And Jesus, when he said Mary has chosen the good part, he was not condemning Martha. He, see, the, if you read the story carefully, Martha was a very hospitable woman, and she wanted Mary to do that with her. And God, Mary, God, Jesus was telling Martha, you know, Mary is doing her thing, and you're doing your thing, and this is okay. See, it wasn't right for a woman to, to study Torah in those days to sit at the foot of a male teacher. And so Jesus was saying, Martha, what you're doing is wonderful, but that's not Mary's calling. She's chosen her calling, and, and that's good too. And, you, the, and we can see that Martha was obviously listening all along anyway because she could make that testimony of faith even before Lazarus was raised. And she knew who Jesus was. She's a great lady. The gift of hospitality is a wonderful thing. The Samaritan woman, two more. I love this story, and I hate the way she's usually preached. The town slut. You know, Jesus comes to the well. It says Jesus was tired, and so... But notice, it says Jesus must go through Samaria. Why is that must there? By the end of the story, we know. And he was, said, the time of day, they say, well, the, the time of day listed there is the middle of the day, and so the, the woman of Samaria was creeping to the well, so no one would see her in the heat of the day because she was so embarrassed. That is not the way the story reads. The story reads that Jesus was tired and thirsty, and it was the middle of the day, and explains it. And if you've ever lived in a culture where there's no running water, and the town well is the source of water, you know that the well is always busy in the middle of the day, especially when people are hot and thirsty. So the well, she wasn't sneaking at the well. There's no reason to believe that. She was there because she needed water. She even says so. And so Jesus, <laughs> you got to read the story. See, we're doing some more narrative work. You got to read the, no, notice the narratives of the story. Jesus, she, Jesus asked her for a drink and she shows already her political intelligence. She says, <clears throat> sir, are you not aware of the political realities around here? <laughs> Samaritan Jews can't even share cups. And Jesus says, well, if you knew who I was, you, you would come to me and I'd give you living water. Now, that's a clue there that he's talking not in, in the time of the Bible. There are two kinds of water. There was still water and living water. Still water is well water that doesn't move, and living water is river water that moves. And that was technical terms, and Jesus is playing with words there. He said, give you living water. She says, boy, tell me where to come. I'll, I'm tired of drawing water. And so Jesus then says, bring me your husband. And she says, I have no husband. And she thought the conversation would end there. And he said, you are absolutely right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now, see, people stop reading the story about this woman right here. And they say, see, she was a town slut. But notice the story. She, she, Jesus was not 
Jesus commended her for telling the truth about her present living in, uh, arrangements. He didn't condemn the other five. She could have been widowed. She could have been divorced several times. In those days, a woman could not instigate divorce. A, a man could tell a woman, I divorce you three times. They're out of the house. No alimony, nothing. If she burned the beans, something as simple as that. And so maybe she, she'd been divorced. Maybe she'd lost her husband. I, I kind of think of her like the Elizabeth Taylor of Samaria. <laughs> Don't you remember what Elizabeth Taylor said? She says, I've never, I've never slept with a man I wasn't married to. And so, so but just put that in there, and we'll keep on going to the story. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus did not condemn her five, relation, five other husbands. You said you had five husbands, I know, and he wasn't condemning her for that. He was condemning her for a present, pre, pl, a present living arrangements. Anyway, so all of a sudden she, she's thinking. You can just hear her thinking there. She said, how does he know that? He must be a prophet, sir. I perceive you must be a prophet. So she says, if you're a prophet, let's talk theology. She first talks politics, then she talks theology. You Jews say we've got to worship in Jerusalem, and we say, the Samaritans say this. What, what's, the, what's the true answer? And Jesus says, the real answer is this, that the true God must be worshipped with spirit and, uh, spirit and truth, Jerusalem or any place, doesn't matter. And he gives her the longest, uh, 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 longest dialogue on true worship anywhere in the Bible, to a pagan Samaritan woman. He couldn't even give this, couldn't even give this talk at home. Ellen White says this is the most important conversation we have in the New Testament, to a pagan woman. So anyway, she says, uh, she talks theology, she says, where, do, where should we worship? And Jesus says, God is spirit, and you must worship him in spirit and in truth. We're not talking about place anymore, spirit and in truth. Now that's really good counsel. There's a lot of churches that have a lot of spirit, and they have no truth. We have a lot of Adventist churches that have a lot of truth and no spirit. And we've got to have them both. We've got to have our hearts and our minds engaged with worship of God. And, and, and all of a sudden her heart starts melting. And she said, you know, the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he will teach us all things. And Jesus said to her, I am. There's no he there. He gives her that holy name of God from the Old Testament. And what does she do? She runs right back to Samaria. She leaves her water pot. And this is why you know, if you finish the story, you know that she wasn't a town slut. She tells the men of the city, come and see a, ma a man that told me everything I ever did. Maybe he's the Messiah. Now you tell me how many men would go see a man who could tell them everything they ever did if they were seeing a prostitute. These men knew that this was a smart city girl. She could talk politics. She should, could talk theology. And when she said, come see somebody, they went. And the men of the city went to, to see Jesus. And they were convinced that she was right. And they even tell her later, now we're convinced, because not just because of what you said, but because we know for ourselves that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Amen. you got to read the whole story. Because uh, she's portrayed in the Gospel of John as a very smart person thinking woman that the men of the city appreciated and came to hear her uh, came to see if her testimony about Jesus was right but there is a prostitute a town slut in the gospels a young woman probably very beautiful she was violated by a church leader it was even her relative which makes it worse and it's not not saying that she was right in this but there was complicity there, but maybe she got pregnant and she had to leave town because Simon's reputation would have been ruined. So she goes to Magdala and participates in the oldest known profession to women. But it, 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 her sensitive mind snapped under this and her mind filled with demons. And Jesus, who knew what had happened and what had caused this, sought her out and healed her. But she couldn't believe that God could really forgive her. And that's what I struggle with my anorectic past. I've had to st tr struggle for years to believe that God could really forgive me for what I did. So I understand Mary. But she, she goes back. Her mind fills with demons, and Jesus heals her again. The book of Desire of Ages tells us that Jesus did this seven times, never once telling this woman, when will you ever learn? The seventh time it held. Amen. 
And then she couldn't get enough about the love of God, and she followed Jesus everywhere, sat at his feet to learn. That is not a sexual term. I don't care what people tell you. Paul says he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. That is a term for a, a, a professor and a student studying Torah. And she was willing to sit at Jesus' feet even though it was, against, it was countercultural at that time. And then her sister Martha got a chance to cater a big feast at Simon's house. And she needed help with a lot of work. A lot of work to set up a retreat like this, right? Can you imagine what it was like to set up a feast for Simon? And she needed Mary's help. And, but how could Mary go back to Simon's house again? But he, Martha did tell her it was for, for Jesus. And she'd had a plan in her mind because Jesus had been saying he was going to be killed. And she wanted to honor him and thank him for how he'd healed her and really believed her in her, no matter when there was nothing to believe in. So she, would, she went. Maybe this is when she could fulfill her plan. And so she took with her this bottle of precious burial ointment. And back in those days, when you ate at a banquet, it wasn't just sit around a table and eat and leave. It, you, it lasted several hours, and people laid on couches, and they had several courses, and it lasted a long time. Sherry, maybe next year you should have a banquet like that. It'd be kind of fun. <laughs> and Mary thought, I'll wait until about the third course when they're all eating and drinking, and I'm, and I'm going to anoint Jesus. I just have to do this before he dies. I want him to know. So she snuck in, and everyone is eating. No one noticed her until she broke the ointment bottle and started pouring the perfume, and then the smell filled the room. And oh, then she realized she meant to bring a towel to wipe it up so it wouldn't cause, cause any attention, bring any attention, but she forgot, so she took her hair down, and she was rubbing Jesus' feet with her hair. And that's not a sexual motion. I don't care what some people say. In those days, it was forbidden for a woman to uncover her hair in public outside her home. And so what she was doing by taking her hair out was violating Jesus by touching him with her hair. And Jesus looked around and watched the reaction. And Judas smugly says, this money should have been given to the poorest, wasted like this. And Simon looked at Jesus with a sneer and said, if Jesus really knew who she was, thinking that Jesus would know Mary's sin and not his. <laughs> but Jesus told Simon a parable. And Simon, in Desire of Ages, it's so beautiful. Simon knew from that parable that Jesus knew what had happened. Amen. And he thanked Jesus for not embarrassing him in front of all the guests. But he knew that Jesus knew. But Jesus saw Mary's face fill with anguish. She was so embarrassed. All she wanted to do was honor Jesus. And she could see all the men glaring at her again. And Jesus, who is God, stood up and he said, you let her alone. She has done a beautiful thing. See, when we talk about the women of the Bible, we're really talking about Jesus, aren't we? Jesus, who saw the very best and the very worst of us and saw something there that he could cultivate and cause to reflect his own image in a dark world. Jesus never restricted a woman's sphere. He never ridiculed women. He never said, oh, help us, the women. Or the ladies, how sweet. <laughs> Jesus talked to them as intelligent thinking person and often commended their faith when he couldn't even commend the faith of his disciples. Oh, how wonderful is Jesus. Amen. So when we talk about women like us, single, married, widowed, and divorced, we're really thanking Jesus for recreating us in his very image.